Jones. <laughs> um, so what I was working on is um, a parasitic crustacean survey within a night of eight. Um, I was advised by Chris and Jim Watkins. So what I'm going to talk about is um, what are parasitic crustaceans? What do I mean when I say that? What do we know going into this survey? And then what were our intentions um, in designing the survey? And then we have some preliminary results because we're not done. And what we're going to do in the future. Awesome job. So um, there's a massive amount of um, variety, as Chris talked about before, um, within the morphology of parasitic crustaceans. Um, the majority of the work I did was with copepods, but I say crustaceans because of this guy, Argolis. Um, so not only do they have a really wide variety within their morphology, which kind of relates to their preferred attachment site. So an Argolis is gonna be a lot larger than a gasless, and our Argolis is gonna be on the outside of the fish. They're kind of these little, kind of like a contact lens almost, that lie flush against the, the um, in of the fish and they use suction cups to attack and walk along so they have very low drag whereas something that's going to be in the gills like an ergastulus that hooks on and has like the end of its body dragging off obviously would have a hard time remaining connected on the outside of a fish so there's some trade-offs between attachment more both morphology and attachment strategy that relate to preferred host and preferred tissue area um, so the main kinds of attachments that I worked with were the suction cups, that hook attachment, and then the anchor, which is a really interesting one. Those guys are often found right kind of where the fin and the skin meets. Um, they're not all plan plankton, uh, excuse me, they're not all parasitic during all stages of their life, and for gasless, only the female are parasit parasitic, so the males are all um, planktonic. So what does an infection look like and what does it do to the fish? Um, there's a lot of different signs of parasitic infection. Um, a parasitized fish itself can carry up to 10 different species of parasites on its entire body. They're usually all grouped into different tissue areas. Um, a fish can have as many as just one to two parasites, up to some have like 10,000. Um, the current record is 13,407, and that was found on a 12-year-old tench. Um, so specific attachment sites are usually dominated by a certain species, whereas if you move to a different area that has parasites there, it's going to have a different species. Um, their parasitic infestations have been shown to reduce growth rates, reduce overall fish fitness, um, as you can see, try bringing in some water over those gills. There's a lot of crowding going on. They're gonna, um, it's gonna be a lot harder for you, you to draw in as much water. Um, and then we also see that um, parasite size and host have a relationship. So larger hosts often have larger parasites. And we also see that relationship with infection. Larger hosts offer, often have worse degrees of infection. Um, <laughs> I mean, okay, like enough. <laughs> like I worked hard on it. That's okay. <laughs> um, so the um, impacts of what does this do to a fish? That's a trout out of Lake Michigan. Um, so that's an example of the inflammation that occurs during um, an infection. And so we see that also on fish that don't have parasites currently. So as an infection, if a fish was able to fight it off. Often they can be left with these scars from inflammation. Um, this is a salmon from, this is from the West Coast though, but that's a really great example of just the mortality, the higher rates of mortality infected fish. And it's kind of a chicken or the egg issue because fish that have parasites have weakened immune systems and then are thus more likely to get parasites because parasitism acts the same way that predation and um, competition act on a community system. So it's the most unfit fish that are most likely to get parasites. And so as the fish gets more parasites, it becomes more vulnerable to more parasites and also other diseases non-parasite related. So that's gonna be something that you're gonna see. This was from an aquaculture facility. So um, although cases like that totally do exist in the wild, those really extreme cases where they're like on the brink of death and you can see the dying tissue at the ends of the gill filaments are often in single species aquaculture environments. 
So what did we know going into this? As Chris mentioned earlier, in 2018, Neogastylus trypomicus was discovered within um, Oneida Lake, and that was the first time it had ever been recorded within the Ontario drainage. Um, the only other parasite work that had been done was like over 30 years ago, they did a really small bass survey, large mouth bass survey of parasites within Oneida. So we didn't really have any idea of what was out there. Um, Neogastylus is an Asiatic species and was thought to be brought over by um, the aquarium trade. So we knew from the surveys that go on in the Great Lakes there, that there are currently 13 known non-native species within the Great Lakes of parasites. Um, so it kind of gave us like a list of potential culprits, like what we could be on the lookout for. And then the other thing we knew is um, we have this long-standing, at Shackleton on Lake Oneida, we have this long-standing data set and sampling efforts. So every summer, there's been the 15 same sites where gill nets are set overnight um, since 1957. So that's really just an incredible amount of data to work with and an incredible amount of effort and energy that was already there. So what was great about the survey was that it could be applied at low cost and low effort to something that already existed. And of those 15 sites, um, the sampling usually occurs over three months, um, or four months, sorry, June, July, August, and September, um, depending on weather. Uh, and we get from that, besides what I was studying, which was taking the parasites off, each fish we have length, weight, obviously speciation, take otoliths, scales, do gut content analysis. And so we have a really great log of information that we can compare with the amount of parasites. So how did we sample this? Um, so weekly we would go down to the gill nets. Um, obviously we gotta pick them all out, and while I'm doing that, I would walk the length of the gill net to see what kind of variety of species we had. So we were sampling for diversity. Um, that, and I also wanted the largest fish, as we know that size relationship um, with parasites. So if I was gonna take four walleye, let's say from a single gill net, I'm gonna take the four largest walleye. Um, and then other species that we didn't see as often, things like drum or um, gizzard chad, we're gonna sample those too. Um, and we'll go over the skin of the fish, the fins, pull everything back, open its mouth, lift the operculum, just really give it a good once over before I would go in and cut out both gill arches. And if anything was found on the outside, often it was, um, usually things like leeches and we have some segmented worms I would collect them to preserve them, although it's not included in this data. We're hoping that that will go towards the genetic barcoding library. Um, so overall, our goals with this survey were to understand, simply understand the diversity and abundance of parasite species within Oneida. So really this had not been done before. We know what's in the Great Lakes, we have no clue what's in some of the outstanding bodies of water. We also wanted to add to the global genetic barcode library, like we saw with Chris's research. So little is known about these guys, so it's really hard to tell which ones are um, species specific, which ones are native to where, is this really not native, and there's a lot of disagreement because also that wide variety of morphology within the same families, and even sometimes within the same species. Like when I was picking parasites, I could see two of the same parasite on different gills and they could look completely different. Like I'm calling up Chris and I don't, I think I found something new, but it's the exact same species. So just depending on the situation they're in, they really can look different and that's led to a lot of taxonomic disputes. <coughs> also, hopefully um, on a broader scale, we could help with the tracking of non-native species within the Great Lakes watershed. So understanding, um, we now know what non-native species are in the Great Lakes and then we can look within the watershed to watch that passive time. So there's that potential for metaphor coding. And lastly, we wanted to just establish a standard parasite survey for continued use, something that Shackleton can hopefully continue to use in the years going forward, um, and also possibly be applied to other bodies of water within the Great Lakes watershed. So overall, we sampled 166 fish. Um, the majority of them were walleye and yellow perch, but we had kind of just a smorgasbord, smallmouth bass, freshwater drum, white sucker, channel catfish, pumpkin seed, red horse, gizzard chat. Obviously they all had different 
um, abundances within the nets. There are a lot of walleye and a lot of perch within Oneida. That's what we're going to get. Also, certain fish are just not really applicable to the sampling method. We use gill net. And so in like over 50 years that Shackleton's been doing this gill net survey, they have never once caught a large trout bass in gill net. So in future work, if we're trying to understand the parasites of fully all species, you would have to go and diversify your sampling methods. Um, no, this is really great. Uh, <laughs> so of the 160 crew gills we excised, we have 137 crosses to date, and that's not because we're lazy or slow, but um, it's really, really intensive work. So the smallest size of, um, like one of the smallest gills I'll work with is usually like either a gizzard chad or a yellow perch. And it's gonna be the quickest when they're small, when it's preserved well and when there's no parasites. And so a yellow perch with no parasites at all can still take an hour to process from start to finish. And that time only increases if um, the gill is starting to deteriorate, if it's a larger fish, and then if it has a really high infection. So the greatest amount that I've done was 18 parasites on one fish, and that took me six hours. Um, so of the 13 species sampled, nine species overall were infected, and the overall infection rate was almost 41%. So that's pretty interesting to know. Um, in this table that's kind of messed up, um, that just go, it's um, a table of our species and how many parasites, how many individuals are affected and then how many parasites in total. So on um, the bottom line should say that um, we had nine species infected and the total number of parasites that we have picked so far, individual parasites is 576. So um, we decided to break this down. Obviously, this is super time consuming. You could see all the species here. Um, so we decided to focus in first on the walleye and perch, not only because that's one we have the most samples of, but because they're some of the more economically important species. So the recreational fishery of Oneida um, is an annual $12 million industry. Um, so we just wanted to pick a starting point that made it easier to break down all this information and also would kind of give us um, an understanding that's greater, that has some meaning for the greater public. So of our yellow perch, this is a regression analysis of only the infected individuals. So this removes those that don't have parasites. And so remember that there were only, I think, um, there's eight, only eight infected, there were only eight infected yellow perch out of 41 or so collected. The average number of parasites per infected perch was 1.6. Um, and then also, since we know about that relationship between um, the size of the animal and the parasites it has, we were looking at um, that with our guys, and it's kind of hard to compare because a lot of these fish have really different shapes of them. So our average yellow perch was basically a square, kind of weighed exactly as much as it was as long. Um, but of those samples, the infection prevalence rate was 20%. And so when we did some larger uh, regression analysis, there's not, um, I'm not comfortable yet saying there's a statistically significant trend, but you are seeing a trend between the number of parasites and the size of the fish. And hopefully once we get more of all of our data completed and then look at the survey from a broader scale, that trend might prove itself to be true or not. Um, also important to note the parasites on the yellow perch were only found at five out of the 15 um, sites and they were in June and August. So now walleye, we found parasites on walleye at every single site all four months. Um, the average number of parasites on a walleye was nearly 16. The walleye weigh a lot more and are a lot longer on average than a yellow perch and their infection prevalence was 80%. Um, Again, this is sorted for a number of parasites. Um, I'm gonna say the same thing again, that I'm not gonna say this statistically significant yet, but there is a visual trend, and hopefully when we get all of that data in, and we have greater sample numbers, it will either prove itself to be true or not true. Um, but what was really interesting about this was the parasites from um, Ontario in their survey, though like really highly parasitized fish, had been yellow perch. 
And so we were kind of going into this thinking, oh, like well, the yellow perch are probably going to be the guys with the most parasites. And it ended up being the wall and the par- and yellow perch were nearly devoid of them. Um, this might have something to do with um, Ontario, obviously a way bigger, way colder lake. The perch out there get a lot bigger than we have in Ontario. I mean, sorry, in Oneida, um, whereas the walleye are a larger fish. Um, so overall, we want to get the parasite counts in for all 163 fish, but I have 26 gills left if anyone wants to come help out. Um, also, long term, we would love to get um, parasite speciation so we can understand the trends between host and um, parasite species. Um, parasite speciation is, as Chris showed you, like really difficult to do. It can take years of training, um, and because of that high level of morphology, but hopefully with enough time and enough bodies, we can figure out if there are any trends there between host and um, the species. We want to send um, all the parasites, every single parasite I picked off the fish are in vials and they're preserved and ready to go for genetic barcoding. So hopefully that will help <laughs> settle some of those taxonomic disputes. Also the leeches, the worms, and all the other weird things we found. Um, we hope to repeat and possibly expand the parasite survey. So it was in its kind of like trial phase last year at Oneida, and then this year we really carried it out, and hopefully that can continue. Um, I mean, my dream would be to be collecting not just 10 fish from every gill net, but 20, 25. Um, obviously, it's a lot of work, but hopefully that we can continue it not only at Oneida, but that we can make kind of um, a format for a sampling plan that can be used in other bodies of water within the Great Lakes watershed. Um, around this time next year, hopefully um, we will be publishing the results of the completed two-year survey. So that's when hopefully those regression analysis will be a little more conclusive. And that will be with all the fish we had. So not just yellow perch, not just walleye, all the species. Um, I'd like to thank everyone out in Shackleton who helped me get fish and play with fish. Also, um, the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences at Cornell was really generous, as was um, the Frederick Gabler Memorial Foundation. Um, here would be my literature cited if this had worked. I swear I have citations. I can email them to you. And um, these are my image credits.